Steve, can you show me how Bigfoot runs? Sasquatch runs like this. <laughs> Pretty good view there, huh? Above the Rhine River. And uh, this is this is what I've been using for the so-called safety mask to go uh, into public with in a town to get groceries. Meanwhile, every single medical professional says the masks don't work. Mm. Whatever. <clears throat> so I trapped my first wolves ever right behind me down on this creek. Lots of memories, lots of history here. Freaking stained up jacket. Spilt the diesel on it. Still pissed off about that. But anyway. Gonna get a this looks like it's gonna be a bit of a doozy email. I think he gave me six pages, but I'm gonna go for it. I'm fresh today. And uh needs to be shared. What do we got? Bursar is attached. Steve, attached my six page story so far. The log to the Jeep's windshield is explained as well as many other encounters, including having a red dot sight on a pair of eyes with an eight inch spread. Hearing them yowl, swim, scare the hell out of my dog and create general mayhem. The only things I ask is if you choose to air this is to call me Woody and keep the exact location ambiguous. Pretty sure I did this well. What I've learned about there, about what I've learned about the, they are an enigma and completely unpredictable, but they certainly know what guns are and they definitely know who not to reveal themselves to. The fellow that I hunt with in North Carolina thinks they do not exist. I think they chose to avoid him like a plague because he's an excellent bear and deer hunter who would not think twice about dumping one. I'm also sure they have seen him harvest many of the hundred plus of bears he's guided people to and he's taken himself over the last 30 years. I really hope they maintain this behavior. I also did my best to punctuation, try not to ramble. I think I did well at the punctuation, and not so well at the later. Sincerely, mm -mm. All right, man, thanks for that. I don't think uh, humans harvesting game has much to do with it, to be honest. I've been doing it for over 20 years, in every species you can think of. And they seem to let me know they're out and about more than enough for me. Who knows? There we go. Hello, Steve. You can call me Woody. And this will run long, very long. 4,000 words, six pages, and 25 years long. Wow. I'll try to put breaks between Florida and the mountains. The motivation came from a Zoom call on Christmas with my sons. It's taken me several weeks, losing it in varying forms of completion, trying to write it, and in my antique email, and then breaking it down and doing it in a word program. On that call, the subject came up, and one of the sons that was with me, when we heard something yell, it was unexplainable, told me that them, told me and them at the time said, no dad, that was just a gibbon. This made me understand how time can skew things, especially when someone is young when they experience it. So what I feel I need to do is get them written down before the decades skew them even more. There are many experiences where I bumped into these things so far, most in the mountains, one of them being where I had a spotlight and a rifle on it, they, he, she, whatever. These encounters run the gambit of the senses except the smell. The most pronounced was a rather large log through my windshield on a remote private road in the mountains. The first two were in the late 1990s on a canal that is the boundary between the Everglades National Park and the South Glades Wildlife Management Area. When the wind was blowing too hard to get out in the ocean, it was our favorite fishing spot for bass, peacock bass, and snook. My two youngest sons and I were using the electric motor and casting to the lily pads and snags when from the large cypress heard a very loud yowl, very loud yowl. That now my civil engineer's son said was a gibbon. It was very loud, really loud, and very long. It was definitely not a gibbon, but it was ape-like. At, at first it did start like a gibbon, a whoop, 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 into a louder, tailing, bovine, oh, with a guttural sound at the end like a bull makes in a rut. It wasn't any monkey I've ever heard, and I've heard a lot, seeing how several 
thousand got loose from Mannheimer Research Facility during Hurricane Andrew '92. It was like it was also unlike any single noise I've heard any critter make before or since. Just after it finished, both of my sons said in near unison they wanted to go home. Now, Dad. Fast forward about a month later, and a friend of mine launched my boat on the same canal. At 23:30 hours, I get up work at 2300 hours and ran to the opposite end with the upboard motor and were slow trolling live bait back to the ramp with electric motor. Since we're the only ones in the canal and we were only going to make one pass, we didn't feel the need for a spotlight because we both knew the canal very well, so we only had a couple of not so bright headlights just to aid in landing the fish. Just after the moon set around 0100, it was like someone turned the audio in the glades off. No frogs croaking, no gators grunting, no crickets, or any of the other preloaded sounds the glades have at night, which trust me are a lot. Dead quiet, except for the whir of the Minn Kota. Then for the high side of the canal to our east where the water management road is, is and nothing for 10 miles, but sawgrass intersped with scrub cypress, oak, and decades of empty aerojet complex, something jumped in the canal, something very large, like a refrigerator large and it was less than 100 yards from us and swimming to the same cypress I had heard the yowl come from. When I say swam, I mean like a human swims. A very audible arm over arm stroke like humans, but it only took three strokes to get across a canal 100 feet wide and 30 plus yards past midnight with no moon in water with some very large gators in it toward the vastness of the Everglades National Park. It took only three strokes to cover the distance. Splash, splash, splash. Some rustling in the cypress and gone. At that point, my fearless six foot four buddy looked at me and said, did you bring your pistol? I responded, no. I asked him the same and he said, no. And then he said nearly the same thing my son said to me, let's go home now. And to Florida events. Fast forward a few years. I start taking the two remaining sons hunting to the mountains of western North Carolina, compliments of a fishing buddy that moved there. The other two were pursuing their lives, going to college and raising families by then. When the last two follow suit, I completely trade fishing any and every body of water and get near for an equal passion of hunting. When the last two follow suit, I completely trade fishing and every body of water and get near for an equal passion of hunting. The best part was my wife, 35 years, so loved the area I started hunting in, we bought a cabin there, in the middle of a large national forest. A mile as the crow flies to the Appalachian Trail, and on the other side, another equally large national forest. Best part was, it set us back the same amount a new 30-foot open fisherman would have. Everything went very smoothly. For the first four years, we owned it. Everything went very smoothly. Everything went very smoothly for the first four years we owned it. There was one night in the first year where I thought I'd do the old wood knocking thing while my wife and I were enjoying a nice summer evening on the porch. I didn't really like this subject. I didn't really take this subject really seriously then or yet. That is until something started knocking back. We still just blew it off as someone down the hall or messing with us. Seems we were wrong. On another occasion, one of my sons did hear what he described as someone mumbling outside the guest room window late one night. Still nothing to worry about. This place is fantastic. Although that son refused to sleep on the, on the first floor to this day, will not leave to hunt before daylight anymore, bought a semi-auto 308 that has a 20-round magazine to hunt with, and carries a pistol too. Now to the meat of my experiences and the most potentially lethal. December 2016, one of my sons and I had been at the cabin for two days and had two deer hanging. On the second evening, he and I had an argument and he left. I continued to hunt and had two more deer hanging by the fifth day and one in the jeep. On that evening, all hell broke loose for me on the private gated road to the cabin. It also made me lose any doubt on the subject. I was coming home from the store that was 20 miles away, three of those miles being gravel forestry road and the last mile private road owned by us land slash homeowners. The stretch it happened on is our gravel community road that accesses 30 homes on over a thousand acres. I had just rounded the last curve, real curve, onto a fairly flat stretch. To my left was a one to three slope with steeper areas covered with poplar, birch, pine, and patches of laurel thicket covering it. 
on the left, a sheer 20 foot drop with young poplar trees lining it with circumferences no bigger than 10 inches. In an instant, the windshield in front of me exploded. Being it was past 9 p.m., the temperature was below 20 Fahrenheit. No moon, the gate was closed because I had to open it, and this time of year only half of the houses are occupied. My only thought that I was being attacked by people, people that were meaning to do, doing very bad things to me. Since I couldn't run, I figured it was time to fight, I wasn't gonna, and I was going to use everything at hand to make it as unfair as possible. If they were going to chuck things at me, I felt it more than fair to chuck stuff back, but much smaller and at much speed. So I got out, and with the indirect light from the headlights of my beater Grand Cherokee that indirectly lit up the thicket, I figured the thing in my windshield must have come from... Oh. What am I... So I got out, and with the indirect light from the headlights of my beater Grand Cherokee that indirectly lit up the thicket, I figured the thing in my windshield must have come from, I started laying cover fire. From my pistol, so I could get the 444 bear rifle out, I kept in the back floor. Hoping that whoever it was would flee when they realized I was not going to be an easy victim. Just as the slide locked back, I had the rear passenger door opened and retrieved the rifle and got it out charged it, and then laid the pistol on the roof. Using the roof as a rest, I realized I had two more problems. My ears were ringing, and the night blindness from the muzzle flashes of the pistol made the ambient light dimmer in the new moon night. After what seemed like an hour, it was probably less than a minute, straining to see or hear anything up that slope, I realized that my pistol was empty, and the rifle only held four rounds, with four more on the stock bandolier. I did, however, have another magazine in the glove compartment. So with one eye on the slope, I opened the passenger door. This is when the full levity, levity of my situation came fully into view. My driver's door was opened on this beater Jeep. Didn't turn the interior light on, but the passenger side did. There, embedded in the crotch of the passenger seat, was a log as bigger around as a coffee can, with the other end sticking out the hole that was 18 inches from my face two minutes ago, picture included. Then it hit me like a train and made me into a solid believer in things that can't be explained. There is no way a man or even a gang of men could have thrown that. There are also no trees here that it could have possibly dead fell from. Something just threw a log too big for any fireplace like a javelin at me, on purpose. Then I just shot 17 bullets at it that we are trained to only use only to get a rifle, and now I have a rifle that seems barely adequate. So I did the only thing I could do. I dropped the magazine out. What I knew now was just a noisemaker, put the fresh one in, then slipped back around the jeep and with my head stuck out the window, with the barrel of the rifle rested on the door, I finished my drive to the cabin. The next two nights were quite sporting, staying there alone, waiting for the windshield to be replaced. The days were quiet, but the nights were eerie. With the rocks and sticks bouncing off the siding and the roof, sometimes at random, but it seemed as I would just start drifting off, there would be some sort of crack or knock or tap or some noise that would snap me back awake. I would describe it as character building and just how vulnerable a person can feel, even with, with some would describe as an arsenal in there with me. Then there was reality if I had my family's yearly venison supply of deer to skin a quarter. To add a little more sport to the mix, there is, by design, no cell or line phone service in our remote mountain getaway. To get, a single, to get a single on my phone took a hike up to a ridge in a forestry land so my calls were made quickly and hardware heavy. It is also not that easy to quarter out deer with a 4570 on your shoulder. My youngest son, I mentioned him earlier, the Gibbon call expert, was also graduating from college in a few days and I needed to be 500 miles south to attend. After this, I'm not willing to roll over and go away so some upgrades, upgrades were necessary. After this, and not willing to roll over and go away, so some upgrades were necessary. Different 4x4 with enough lights on it to light up a football field, upgraded hunting rivals, along with lots and lots of practical practice with them and with Magnum handguns. But let me continue because this ain't done yet. Actually, I'm not sure it'll ever be done. It was also between these years I found your and Dave's channels, so I added a personal locator with text cap capability. My son had forgiven me my son had forgave me for my boorish behavior and went with me the next year without incident with all the new goodies. The following year, though I got to see the furry fornicator, but this time through a no magnification 4MAO red dot sight and a coyote rifle. 
We had been at my friend's house and gotten back to the cabin around 2300 hours. My son had to go to the bathroom, had to go to the bathroom, and I grabbed not a real bright but adequate rechargeable indescendent spotlight to check a coyote bait we had 100 yards from the front door across the pond. While there wasn't a yote on the bait, but up the slope from the pond and not far at all from where our driveway is, there was an eye glow. Not a red eye glow, but a defined pair of eyes glowing white. They were spread so far apart, I thought it was two coons or possums in a tree. Problem, they were moving together and looking straight at me. They were also swaying slightly where one would go out and return, like they were behind something. I raised the rifle and supported it my forearm, then put the dot just below its eyes. The eyes were noticeably on either side of the dot that covers four inches at 100 yards. So whatever I was looking at had a spread between its eyes of at least eight inches. Just for a reminder, you guys, big, big grizzly bear, the gap between the eyes is around four and three quarter inches, all right? <laughs> Just for a reference. And that's a grizzly bear you can put your head in its mouth. Then something very odd happened. I felt peaceful. When I first saw the eye glow, I was trying to get my son to bring me one of the upgraded rifles. Then after I lowered the less powerful but still upgraded varmint rifle, I felt no need for the superior heavy hardware. The rest of that trip went off without a hitch, but from that point on, I felt like we would leave, I felt like we should leave the livers and the hearts inside the coros after cleaning the deer. Then the next year, my wife and dogs, a taller retriever and a four foot long, 20 inch tall, 100 pound basset lab mutt started coming up in and more encounters happened. When you say these things scare dogs, you're correct. Some are more scared than others though. From the first night there, the two of them knew some very different things were there, but they are suburb dogs and a bit naive. But now one of them is scared to death to go outside at night because he's seen it up close because of his naive nature and charging into things head first. When we first got there, he leapt from the truck and frolicked about like a wild dog. He loved the place. That was until he got a close look at Mr. Fuzzy. Now when we get there, he tries to hide under the seat and has to be removed from the truck. If it's dark, he won't go outside unless he's on a lead. The first few days we were there with them was great for the Toller Retriever and the Bassador. They would alert like the FedEx guys were coming up to the door at all hours of the night. I figured it was a deer, a bear, or some other critter their city dog cells weren't really familiar with. They really loved the snow and seeing the Bassador bulldoze through it, through it is great. They really loved the snow and seeing the Bassador bulldoze through it is great. Then one night they were going exceptionally nuts, so I let them out and followed them with a pistol and a headlight. The Toller went blazing out the back door and around the corner of the cabin up to the edge of the slope where we had just that afternoon dumped two deer cores, liver and hearts, inside and they got separate. He thought he thought he was on a mission to get whatever it was evading his new playground. I rounded the corner of the cabin and get the light on him just in time to see him sliding to a stop at the edge of the drop of the carcasses were 10 feet below the edge of the creek. When I say he slid, he braked so hard while at the same time trying to turn around his front end, didn't know where his back end was. At the same time, I heard something crashing through the laurels lining the creek bottom, and it was headed up the creek bed and up the mountain. The taller went past me and back into the cabin like it was a lake and he was on fire. Funny thing is, the bastador just hung next to me with his head down, thrown back, with his head thrown back, sniffing like a good hound would. I eased where the taller just did his aerobatic act at with the bassador at heel. I peered over and no one, not no one, I peered over and not one, but both deer cores were gone. The laurels going up the creek, up the laurels going up the weak bottom looked like someone drove a small car through them. From that moment, the taller would not go out after dark. For him, the new was worn off the place when the sun goes down. Okay, so now we're winding down to our 2020. Okay, so now we're winding down to 2020. On our way up, my dear, on our way up, my dear friend who maintains the cabin calls me and says our 200-pound propane tank that we had filled the month before was empty. Not only was it empty, but the supply line going to the regulator on the outside of the cabin was pulled out of the fitting. The top of the tank's valve was turned off at the tank. My 40-year career in the domestic water treatment and distribution has made me quite familiar with every sort of connecting device used to connect the hollow tubes together. From one quarter inch flared copper control lines to 36 inch mechanical joints I'm very acquainted with. He said it looked like someone yanked the gas line 
out of the regulator and the tank was empty. So I called the gas company and $500 later, I had gas and they checked for internal leaks. There were none. The technician had an opinion on how the line was yanked out. When I arrived, my buddy came up and we looked things over. I kid you not, something did pull the six foot long, three eight inch flared soft copper line that went from the tank to the regulator out of it with such force it pulled the flare straight. It did this without pulling the regulator off the cabin siding and without kinking the line. Whatever did it then had to open the wherewithal to open the tank's valve after yanking the line out and then close it after the tank emptied. Crazy. It also had to support the regulator on the side of the cabin that was only attached to some small wood screws. When I went to the gas company to ask about, the res about it, the response was quite interesting. I had the fitting and the pictures in hand and worked my way up the chain to Mr. Gasco guy himself. It's a small town and I won't mention them by name. When I asked him directly what he thought did this, a bear or a vandal, uh, before I could get anything else out, he said, you and have that place up in the creek, right? Might be a Sasquatch. And then he walked off and the receptionist gave me, just gave me a shrug. Well, that's about it. That was until three weeks ago I got a call from my buddy up there. He and his sons were going to go up there for some guy time. When he went up to, to light the pilot light on the heater, it wouldn't light. Lo and behold, the gas tank was dead empty again. Everything in the tank this time, but he said the valve was off and the only thing on the cameras watching the back sides in front of the cabin were deer, bears, and a turkey or two. This game playing is getting old and expensive. I'm starting to understand how we got the place for 30 cents in the dollar and why the fellow we bought it from was wearing a pistol when he hiked the property. He only left the place with what he could carry in a Jeep Liberty and even left his border collie. Holy shit. My friends there adopted him and he lived the rest of his life at their house seven miles away. Another thing about that, once they got into their house, it never tried to get back up to the cabin and wouldn't get out of the truck when they took him up there. Ugh. I will, not that, I will not let this critter run me off. I will not be intimidated by it. I've worked through cleaning up after. I've worked through, cleaned up after, and rebuilt our home when needed after every category hurricane the weather serves ha services has. Duplicates on a few. I could list the rest of the hard lesson life events, but this is approaching 4,000 words and would be moot. Just want to have my place in the world, and it, they can have theirs. I won't take any more game that I need for my family, and I will keep feed those that remain in the lean winter months. Now though my grandson and granddaughters will be coming up there, spending time hiking, hunting, and fishing, chopping wood, learning to garden, and all the other skills that are dying in our country, I'll be damned if I'll let them take that from me. I don't want to start a fight with them, but if they push me to it, I'm, I am very well prepared to give as good as I get. Oh, then my wife's no pushover either, and she is also a firm believer now. She served on a mobile nuclear missile crew long ago in West Germany, and I'm sure she would have zero patience if she felt, if she felt one of her grandbabies were threatened. <laughs> we don't piss off the females of any species. They are always the most lethal, <laughs> without a doubt. I sent snippets of these events to others on social media and posted in forums that I was more naive about the subject. I've even been contacted by some of the, quote, researchers, end quote, and entertained thoughts of inviting them up. Fortunately... I got bad first impressions and never gave my places the exact location, luckily. Then I found your channel and started looking into the subject further, and I fully understand remaining anonymous and keeping my places paramount. Sincerely, mm -mm -mm -mm, name and location. Wow. And there you go. And you're definitely not the only one who's got that sentence of having to deal with these... What do you want to call them? I don't know what to call them. <laughs> my my vocabulary isn't usually most friendly as vocabulary for them when they intentionally terrify and, and harass people, right? Kind of sucks. But it's funny. I, I believe with most of those, it, there's different things running around, without a doubt. But uh, I, uh, not too long ago, I would every time I went up the trail in the dark, I was basically... Uh, speaking out, basically speaking out loud just under my breath, F you. you. You come and harass me, I'm going to put as many holes in your head as I can, so stay the F away from me. And I was obviously a little aggressive in my thoughts, in my speech. <laughs> I think it worked, though. Although, 
they do let me know they're there at least a couple few times a year, right? In various places in the province, really. And uh, I've toned it down a bit. I'm more, a little more mild now in neutral. I basically just tell them, you know, just leave me alone. Leave me alone. I'll leave you alone. I don't give a shit if you're here or not. Just leave me and my family, whoever, alone. And uh, you know, let's not ruin it for each other, right? But then there's all the other alarming things that are going on today. And one of those things, obviously, uh, knee-jerked me into uh, being a little pissed off when I'm thinking about it. And I made that ramble video a little while back on the topic. I emailed that person back. I emailed a person back who contacted me who is having some... He's had a absolutely unnerving, substantial experience that I really want to share with everybody. I feel it's very, very important. And I emailed him back to see how he was doing. Um, he really needed to talk to somebody right away. And the only way I found that email was going back about six pages. And I found it, and I read it, and I, and I replied to him right away. Very intelligent man. And uh, his story is similar with numerous other stories around the planet. Um, I think David Pilatus has been looking into a lot of these things that really line up with the experience this very intelligent man had. And from what he said to me was my fuel to tell all of you exactly what to do when you feel terrified, the forest goes dead silent, um, you feel a little foggy in the head or it's just tough for you to move, and you have to turn around and go back immediately. Okay? Um, that one last... I've had a couple emails lately that confirmed that that is very very important and i am going to repeat those words numerous times in future submissions to this channel that is very very important all right so very good back to you sir thanks a lot for taking that time out to write all that down to send it um, that's a big effort and i appreciate it and i know that there is obviously tens of thousands of people here on this channel that appreciate your effort too okay and uh, be safe out there, man. You know, I've talked to other people that I know who know people who brought these beings food over a course of time for a long time. And he said flat out, he goes, I think it's a bad idea. I've had a lot of people who have been familiar with these things and seen them a lot say, don't feed them. Don't feed them. Teach their own. But uh, it's funny, they... Um, it's a confusing, there's a lot of confusing things that, that come with these things. You know, what they will eat. You know, the uh, First Nations guy here in the Mount Curry Band was telling me how they could see, he could see the adult footprints going into the Birkenhead River and on the edge of the river, and the young one was, wasn't going to the water, he was walking along the side of the river, and he said there, you know, when salmon have spawned out and they're just laying there decaying, it's just a big yellow pile of mush. He said they were collecting, he could see where they were grabbing all of those ones to take back wherever they're taking it and doing with it whatever they're doing it. How disgusting is that, right? And there's that 300-pound uh, domestic sheep that we dumped in the middle of that cut right there too, right in full view of that particular area. And, uh, and something picked it up and took it away. And they only left a piece of hide about that big and it was completely, perfectly blue on the flesh side, meaning skinned off. There wasn't... It was perfect. It's so clean, but it wasn't cut off. It was just like, it's almost like they just tore that piece of hide off, sniffed or looked at the meat, whatever they were doing, and that's all they left. It's almost like they possibly left it for me. I don't know. But it is amazing what they, uh, they're not picky. They're not picky. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining if it's got protein in it, they're going to eat it. <laughs> but anyway. Maybe I'll switch his camera up and see if I can give you guys another view. I'm gonna keep going until the batteries die. Then I get it home and I gotta do, I got a lot of stuff to do because we're getting ready to le relocate. We're doing a major move. Oh my God, it's gonna be a, a challenging thing to do, but life changes all the time, right? Be safe out there, you guys.